about our next event, and that is on <laughs> the 13th of September, and it's uh, the sugar panel. And the topic is, is sugar making us sick? And it will be moderated by Professor Emeritus John Schwartzberg. And I'm also supposed to say that it appears to be already sold out. Um, so we want to make sure that people who haven't signed up look for it on the live stream and also check out on the website. And if we end up having some more space, then um, that should be available on the website. Uh, tonight, we have an exciting panel. And it's on a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, the topic of the panel is global health and the role of the US government. And this is an incredibly either weird or opportune time to have such a discussion. Um, you know, I was thinking as I was walking over here that um, we keep globalizing more rapidly as the years go by, um, but certainly not in my lifetime, that at least that I know of, have we had this level of backlash against globalization. So we're living at a time of extraordinarily fast globalization and at the same time extraordinary backlash against it. And um, Brexit in the UK and, and uh, the Trump administration in the US are just the most um, obvious examples of that. But I think that there are similar things and, and similar discussions happening in many other places. And so I think that this couldn't come at a, at a more opportune time it, um, it's also a topic that's very close to my own heart. It's one that I spent my whole life working on until I came here to the university. And this panel is one that is also very near and dear to my heart. Um, Leah Fernald is going to moderate. She's here to my left. And Leah and I met because she came down and worked with me in Mexico for two years um, on her K Award from the NIH. And then I was so happy to be able to come back to Berkeley in part because I knew she was here. And uh, so that's great. Next to her is Mike Merson. And um, uh, Leah is going to tell you a little bit more about his bio. But uh, Mike gave me my first real job. And he was my first real boss. He recruited me straight out of residency. In fact, um, they actually recruited me out of residency. And I thought that they meant at the end of my residency. But instead, they meant no right now. <laughs> And so I left a year before the end of my residency, and I unfortunately never went back. Um, so I suppose I could blame Mike for that. But he, um, he really opened up global health uh, for me and created extraordinary opportunities for me. I ended up following him and shutting down the global program on AIDS um, at WHO. And then next to him is Amy Batson, who um, hails from where I just came from not too long ago, now in Seattle, where she's at, at PATH. And uh, Amy has been incredibly good to us because we have had a couple events where we do this global health challenge, where we bring in folks. It's like a shark tank for innovation in global health. And Amy has been really kind to be one of our judges. And the, one of the reasons that she was in Seattle was because her husband was a colleague of mine at the Gates Foundation. So I'm incredibly grateful for the to the three of them for being here tonight. And because I know them all pretty well, I know that it will be an interesting and lively discussion. Um, before I turn it over, let me just mention a little bit more about Leah, because she doesn't uh, get to introduce herself. Um, she worked uh, when she was in Mexico with me on the impact of the Oportunidades program, which is the sort of the program that made conditional cash transfers famous. Um, it is a program that gives money to families so that they do the right thing by their kids. And Leah was very interested in how that program affected the development of children, and in particular looking at the intersections of, of nutrition, stress, and cognitive development. She's continued working in, in similar areas, infants and children in low and middle income countries um, ever since. She's been working in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. She designs and examines interventions, especially around nutrition and poverty. And she looks to see how we can reduce inequity. And um, she's going to be moderating the panel. The panel is, is looking at a study that was done by the National Academy of Medicine. And uh, they typically convene these committees to do these expert studies. And these guys didn't chair it, but I think that they are the roadshow, um, not just here, but in lots of other places, because they are the articulate spokespeople on behalf of the, the committee. So um, with that, I think I'm going to um, turn it over to Leah and let her tell you a bit more about her part. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you, Steph, for the introduction. I sincerely hope we are articulate spokespeople today. Um, before talking about the report, I want to introduce our esteemed panelists. So Mike Merson is the founding director of the Duke Global Health Institute and a professor of global health at Duke University. In addition, Mike is the university's vice president and vice provost for global affairs. He's authored more than 175 articles in disease prevention and global health policy, and he's the lead editor of a book that I do assign my students to read, Global Health Diseases, Program Systems, and Policies, a leading global health textbook. He is the recipient of two honorary degrees and the Surgeon General's Exemplary Service Medal and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. And Amy Batson is the Chief Strategy Officer and Vice President of Strategy and Learning at PATH. She is responsible for guiding PATH's strategy, strengthening their partnerships and business relationships, and contributing to advocacy and policy priorities. Amy has an impressive 20-year career in global health and has worked at WHO, UNICEF, the World Bank, and most recently at USAID. Her contributions to immunization and vaccine financing at the World Bank resulted in millions of, and billions actually billions, sorry, um, dollars in new funding for global health and vaccination of millions of children against polio, pneumonia, and other vaccine-preventable causes of death. I just say on a personal note that I have learned a lot from working with both of you on this report, so I do appreciate that. I'm going to give you a few slides of background about the report, how it was put together, and then I'll let Amy and Mike guide you through the summary recommendations, and then we'll have a chance for questions. So the first question we ask ourselves, and the really the driver for what the report, why we worked on this report, why invest in global health. So we know that globalization and increased travel and trade are really causing increases in global security threats and an increase in rapid information sharing and opportunities. We also know that it's extremely important to secure protection against global health threats and that investing in global health can help promote productivity and economic growth in other countries. Finally, through investments in global health, we can save the lives of millions of children and adults over the next 20 years. There's a, there's a very high benefit to investments in low- and middle-income countries. And for these reasons, the charge, when we began the report, the charge in brief was to assess the current global health landscape and how it has evolved over the last eight years, which was when the previous report was written, and offer conclusions and recommendations to guide the next administration, as well as funders. We were charged with reviewing the, government, um, the government's external leadership and internal coordination of the global health enterprise and offer recommendations on how to improve responsiveness and efficiency. I would say what our charge was not, our charge was not to write a textbook on global health and include everything in global health. Our charge was not to cover every topic. And as a matter of fact, this probably produced the most controversy within the report and during the process was trying to figure out what to do and how to prioritize. So one of the most difficult things we had to grapple with was to prioritize what to do within certain budgetary constraints, within certain capacity constraints and resource constraints. So it's probably going, to, you're going to realize that there are gaps in what we, what we um, included in the report and we can talk about what we did in the report and we can talk about it in the report and we can talk about <laughs> um, and, and so it's a much better idea to just download it online. Um, study sponsors were, are included here. You can see range from government organizations, private industry funders, who all contributed to the report. And I will tell you some key messages, review the conceptual model, and then turn it over to Amy and Mike, who will um, provide you with actual summary of our recommendations. So after this year of reviewing the literature and deliberating extensively, we've decided on the following key messages. First, the priority areas for action, which we'll talk in more detail about today, achieving global health security, maintaining a sustained response to continuous threats, saving and improving the lives of women and children, and promoting cardiovascular health and preventing cancer. Um, then we also focused on embracing a system-focused concept of integration, capacity building, and partnership. And then I would say probably the most innovative, this, these, these topics would not surprise anybody in global health, but I would say where we really were able to be more innovative was thinking about changing the way we do business in global health to better enable innovation. So this means accelerating development of medical products, enabling harmonized digital health infrastructure, optimizing financial strategies, and maintaining US leadership in global health architecture. So this is our conceptual model now, and we'll be referring, I'll leave this here because it, it's helpful to refer to it when we talk about the content of the report. So you can see that with the 
you can see the four key areas covered, global health security, continuous communicable threats, saving and improving the lives of women and children, and then promoting cardiovascular health and preventing cancer. And then the cross-cutting themes across all of these topic areas, catalyzing innovation, smart financing, and global health leadership. So I will, I will leave this slide up and then hand it over to Mike, who's going to summarize the global health security and continuous communicable threats and cardiovascular health, and then Amy will sum summarize the remainder. And then we'll have time for questions. So thank you, Leah, and thank you, Steph, uh, for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the, I think it's important to just um, say again that we had a very specific charge, and our client was the U.S. government. And it's important, as we have this discussion, to understand that um, when you sit on a committee like this, you always are very clear on what the charge is, and goes over, we go over and over the charge because we, you often get diverted into uh, other topics. So remember, this was a report to the U.S. government. Uh, on what we felt the U.S. government should do in global health in the future. A little ironically, our work started uh, in September, and something happened in November, and we finished our work in April. So you will understand that the, the, in a report of this nature, I'm just taking a minute on this, Leah, we, we take testimony from a lot of people. Uh, that testimony is always open testimony. That you don't take any closed testimony. But of course, we were faced with the challenge of people who soon were leaving their jobs and not clear on a large number of people who were taking their jobs. So we were faced with some real challenges putting this report together. But, but, and just to point out, the National Academy really has one rule of thumb and that whatever we write has to be evidence-based. And when we get reviewed, the question always come up, comes up, what is the evidence for what you're saying? I just wanted to go over that because I think this will be relevant to, to the findings that, that we will briefly present. It's a 350-page report. We're going to present it in a, you know, 20 to 25 minutes at most <laughs> and, and try to give you a sense of what's up there. So on the global health security, which is under securing global threats, I don't, this audience knows a lot about global health security. You know about why we've had these, um, this turnover of viruses that, that move from being infectious in animals to infectious in humans. Uh, we've had SARS, then we've had Ebola, Zika, yellow fever raging now, cholera in Yemen, the worst cholera outbreak I think the world has ever faced. So we have constantly had not just the zoonotic problems, but organisms that we've had before moving into new environments where they, you don't have immunity. And the great fear we all have in the area of global health security is flu. If we get a flu strain that uh, we've never seen before that mutates from an animal species and we have never had antibody to it and we don't have a vaccine immediately available, that is the greatest threat the committee felt by far in terms of global health security. And of course, Steph has mentioned the fact that viruses don't need passports, and we've seen how quickly uh, these organisms can spread in our globalized world. So there, were, there was no question in the, in the committee about the threats that exist around global health security. The vulnerabilities are clear uh, in our own country, our public health infrastructure. We don't have to talk here and right now about Houston, but we have a very vulnerable public health infrastructure in this country. Um, around the world, there are very vulnerable supply chains for, for drugs and vaccines. Amy may say more about this. And then we have a whole bunch of other challenges. We have the, the challenge of urbanization. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa was clearly an example of Ebola moving in, in, from a rural area to an urban area, entering into places it had never been in and could not be controlled in an urban environment in hospitals. We've had complacency. We have our outbreak, and then we forget about it. Uh, historically in terms of global health. Uh, we haven't really had a leadership globally. WHO, we, we will talk about later, has not been able to provide us the leadership in global health security. And even in our own country, and I, I'm going to just say one sentence, although there's a lot more behind it, when we've responded to various threats, um, there hasn't been a clear um, level of responsibility. We've not had anyone in charge. Some of you may remember that President Obama, after months, appointed an Ebola czar, but it took months to happen. 
So, so we have had all of these challenges in, in security. And what the committee recommended were two things, uh, two areas, I should say. One on the domestic front. We strongly recommended the creation of an international response framework, very much like what we see today in FEMA. Uh, and this is really having an, a, a proactive approach to emergencies and having a single coordinating body to guide our own country's uh, response to um, emer health emergencies with designated leadership, clear chain of command, and dedicated funding. You may remember the debate in the Congress, which we looked at carefully around Zika, how many months it took to get the Zika funded. That's just not tolerable if we as a nation are going to deal with these uh, uh, epidemics that occur. And so you need dedicated funding for preparedness, dedicated funding for response, and for medical product development. Some of you may know that pharma faces huge challenges in, in stockpiling and making and stockpiling vaccines uh, for emergencies which may or may not occur. Um, so on the domestic front, we had some very strong recommendations uh, on how to respond. On the international front, we felt here that uh, the U.S. government had to do a lot more to strengthen the public health capacity of low- and middle-income countries, including disaster risk reduction and disaster response. Some of you may know or have heard of the Global Health Security Agenda, which started about two years ago. It's actually been housed in Europe, not in this country, but we are one of 50 nations that have joined this, this agenda. Um, it, CDC has helped a great deal in some of the action packages that have been offered to countries through the FETP program and has been one of the few, I would say, burgeoning successes globally in dealing with the global health security agenda. And so we recommended that the U.S. stick with this, become more of a partner in this, and dedicate funding to it. This could be done through the, through the Fogarty or through other, other agencies. With regard to my earlier point about where this international leadership should come from, this, this new framework, this new coordinating body, we actually didn't take a stand on that. We spoke to many people about which part of the U.S. government could host that, and we got many differences of opinions, and so we left it to the Congress, hopefully, and the administration to deal with that. The second area under the, that I just want to mention under the security issue, um, which we took up, but I, we don't have a lot of time to go into here, is the area of antibiotic resistance. You all know that this has finally gotten the attention it deserves. Uh, we, and there are projections of as many as 30 million deaths by 2050 because we're not going to have antibiotics to treat uh, the diseases that need to be treated. Um, we recommended enhanced surveillance systems. We recommended assisting low-income countries in infection control and antibiotic stewardship. We recommended that AID help to leverage supply chains and strengthen um, these around the world, deal with the, the real challenge of illegitimate antimicrobials, uh, and improving the quality of antimicrobials. And then we strongly recommended more research on the development of therapeutics alternatives to antibiotics for, for treatment of infectious diseases. We can go into that if you're interested. The second, so I, that's the global health security area. The area of continuous communicable disease threats, here we took on the triad, which I'm sure you all know, of AIDS, TB, and malaria. This is sort of the unfinished agenda. Um, and I'm sure this audience knows that we've made real progress in, in AIDS uh, in terms of reducing incidence and mortality. But still, we have a way to go. Only 60% of uh, people infected know their status. Only 50% of cases that need ARVs, antiretrovirals, are getting them. Uh, and so we, we're no, we certainly haven't finished what's needed with our response to AIDS. With regard to tuberculosis, in all honesty, the committee felt we're in much, much worse shape. This is an area that has not gotten the attention that AIDS or malaria has gotten by our government. Um, um, and, and in fact, today there are more people dying of TB than there are of AIDS in the world. And uh, there's an increasing problem, of, as you know, of multi, multi resistance, multiple drugs with uh, multiple antibiotic resistance to TB. And, we, and we're not developing drugs fast enough for TB. So while there's been real progress in AIDS and, and a hopeful future, it's the situation with TB was actually, we felt, more dismal in some ways. Malaria, again, the, there was a feeling that we had made good progress. There's certainly leadership here in, in the city, um, in San Francisco, in terms of decreasing incidence, mortality, 
but we still face, of course, drug and insecticide resistance. So our recommendations, well, and I also should say that the U.S. should be proud of two programs. One is PEPFAR, which we, we looked at very carefully, uh, and what it had done and what it, had, what it proposes to do. And we also looked at the Global Fund, which the U.S. has been against AIDS, TB, and malaria, which the U.S. has spent a, a good deal of resources supporting and being on the board and being a strong partner in. So our recommendations here were three. One on AIDS, uh, to fund PEPFAR at least, continue funding PEPFAR, which takes right now, 60, if you exclude NIH, 60 to 70% mm -hmm. and the Defense Department. Include NIH and the Defense Department and look at global health funding, 60 to 70% goes into HIV AIDS. And we recommended that continue. There's an ethical imperative of keeping uh, people on treatment. Uh, there were also diplomatic benefits. But we felt that PEPFAR needed to change in some ways. It needed to have more flexible funding targets. It needed to continue transitioning ownership of AIDS programs to national governments. Amy will probably say more about domestic financing. That's happened in South Africa and Botswana, but it needs to happen elsewhere. We recommended that it, its platform for, be used much more for other kinds of chronic illness. And we recommended that much more emphasis continue to be given on prevention. We're not going to be right now, we don't have a cure, we don't have a vaccine, but we have promises, but we don't have either. And we, we're not going to be able only to treat our way out of this epidemic. And, and we looked very carefully at the situation in Southern Africa, where some of you may know the population is growing very, of young people is growing very quickly. Young girls are at great risk, uh, particularly being infected by men of 10 years or older, more uh, of higher age than they are. This is a real threat to the future of the, of the epidemic in Southern Africa. And here we recommended that projects like the DREAMS project, which is currently uh, a new PEPFAR initiative, continue to be funded uh, within the PEPFAR program. We also recommended that the Global Fund continue to be supported. And what we were impressed with is how much in the last two years, talking with the Global Fund and with PEPFAR, they have worked very closely to try to be sure that they're not providing resources in the same areas. So that there is no longer the kind of duplication that mm. used to exist with PEPFAR and the Global Fund, which justifies more the funding of the Global Fund. The Global Fund can also help with, with domestic resource mobilization. In the case of TB, we were a little bit at, at a loss as to a specific recommendation, because the situation, as I've already said, is not a, a good one. We recommended that CDC, AID, and, and the NIH conduct a thorough global threat assessment of TB and execute a plan for developing and investing in diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, and delivery systems, basically asking the federal government to take TB seriously, which it hasn't done so far. And then thirdly, with malaria, we were very impressed with the President's Malaria Initiative. Some of you may know this initiative. It sits within USAID. PEPFAR, as you know, is at a, is at a very high ambassador level, but, but AID has taken on the Malaria Initiative and done very well, and we recommended that continue to be supported. One other point. There's been a lot of discussion, we may come back to this later, on USAID and CDC cuts. And that hasn't happened, but there have been proposals for cuts, dramatic cuts in the AID and CDC budget. Just to be clear, PEPFAR cannot operate without a strong CDC and a strong USAID. PEPFAR is implemented by those two agencies in the field. So if one were to cut AID and one were to cut CDC, one could not implement PEPFAR to the degree that it needs to be implemented. I just wanted to add that because this came up a lot in, in our discussions. Then I'm going to leave it to Leah to take up women and children because she knows she was our expert on the committee. I'm just going to jump last to the cardiovascular health and preventing cancer. So here we took a risk. And let me try to just give you a, a minute of background. There had been report after report coming out of the National Academy and many other expert groups on the problem, increasing problem of non-communicable diseases. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's endless, the number of reports, and which have resulted in basically little action by the U.S. government. There may be good reasons for this, but not just by the U.S. government, but by other funding agencies. This is just not an area that's caught on. So we decided to take a little bit of a risk and be a little more specific. We knew this might upset the mental health people, the chronic lung people, the chronic kidney disease people. I mean, we knew there was a risk in trying to do, prioritize this. But what we reasoned was the following. First of all, there are, behavioral, there, there are behavioral factors that account for a lot of the NCDs. 
Secondly, if you were to pick one NCD that, ha that affects by far more than any other NCD, it's hypertension. All the data we looked at, 40 to 50% of adults, and an increasing number of adults reaching their 40s and 50s and 60s around the world have hypertension, usually missed, not neglected until they fall sick with stroke or cardiovascular disease or kidney disease. So we decided to really look carefully at cardiovascular disease and hypertension as a major intervention area where there are cheap drugs that can be used around the world. And the second area was cancer, where people throw up their hands, can't do anything about cancer. And here we thought that's, that's just not true. There are cancers that one can deal with um, and, and are quite common. So our recommendations on, in this area, the three we had was one, focus on behavioral risk factors, uh, asking the US government to take more seriously programs fighting smoking and obesity uh, as, as, as behavioral risk factors. Secondly, uh, uh, giving priority within the NCD area to hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And third, de detection and treatment of early cervical cancer, which is certainly possible, particularly within the PEPFAR framework, uh, and immunization for HPV and hepatitis B. So, so we, we, that is the extent, and we knew that there are not going to be everyone happy, and everyone's gonna be happy, but we felt we needed to brand the NCDs in a way that people would at least do a few things well. Now there were two other things. One, we were impressed by all that the private sector was doing. And if you look in our report, you'll see there's many examples of how the private sector has moved in this area with pilot programs, uh, might be reasons for this in terms of their getting their drugs used, but nevertheless, the private sector has really, much more than the US government, provided funding for pilot programs on NCDs. And we felt that USAID and CDC should seek to mobilize the private sector and work with them on CBD and cancer. This was a really a good place for the public and private sector to work together. And then we felt, going back to what I said earlier, that, what, that instead of insisting on vertical NCD programs to try to use existing platforms, and I've already given you the example um, of the PEPFAR platform, which is basically treating chronic disease and sees a lot of patients with cancer and with cardiovascular disease. Uh, and so we called for use of existing platforms. So that's a quick summary of uh, those three areas. Uh, and I now turn it over to Leah, who will Great. handle the saving and improving the lives of women and children. Thanks, Mike. So we thought about the work ahead of us in, for women and children to falling into three categories, thinking about survival, thinking about thriving, and thinking about transforming the system. And I'll talk mostly about survival and thriving, and then Amy will pick up on the transformation. So the first category of survival, it, it falls into the unfinished business category that Mike was mentioning about um, HIV, TB, and malaria. Each year, still six million children are dying from, by their fifth birthday, and half of these, 2.5 million, are dying in their first year of life. And the vast majority of these are preventable deaths. In addition to these deaths, there's 300,000 women dying from pregnancy and childbirth-related causes, and most of these deaths are also preventable. So there's good evidence supporting many effective interventions with these populations, and so really the current challenge is to implement and scale those existing interventions. We also identified a particularly vulnerable population that's, that are needing support, and those are the 50 million refugees and displaced people, many of whom are children and infants. So our conclusions from our summary of the literature in women and children is that these current mortality rates are unacceptably high, and we actually have good evidence base about many interventions that could work to prevent the deaths of infants, children, and adolescents, pregnant, and lactating women. So here's our recommendation. USAID really needs to accelerate their investments in ending preventable maternal and child death. And we have specific areas that investments should focus for the highest impact interventions. And these are also supported by rigorous monitoring and evaluation. So these priority interventions include immunization, integrated management of child illness, nutrition for pregnant women, newborns, infants, and children, prenatal care and safe delivery. So this includes early identification of at-risk pregnancies, safe delivery, and access to emergency obstetrical care, and then access to contraceptives. So those were our key recommendations. And these then will, the goal is to, again, the unfinished agenda of, of maximizing survival. Now, the new recommendation or the new area that we tackled in this report that hadn't been covered before is the area of thriving. So more and more data are showing that children who, if, as we're increasing survival, there's a whole population of children who then 
um, need to thrive and have to reach their developmental potential. So we know that 250 million children younger than five years, so 43%, do not reach their developmental potential because of extreme poverty and stunting. And we also have a, a sustainable development goal that calls for all children to be, have early child development and pre-primary education by 2030 so that they're ready for primary school. So now that we're, we are having a decline of the nutrition and infection related mortality and a push for universal, pre, universal school, so there's really the support and promotion of child development is crucially important at this stage. So there's very good evidence of the long-term effects of early investments in child cognitive and language development, and these translate directly into labor market participation, earnings, and economic growth. So these investments made in early years, there's just more and more accumulating evidence that these investments in early years allow children to thrive, and that they can then generate greater lifetime earnings to promote health, they can have increased productivity and economic growth. So really adding this agenda of promoting thriving in addition to surviving is a focal point for investment. So as our conclusion relating to thriving, to achieve this goal of children being prepared for primary education and then thriving in their, over their lifetime, there really needs to be a focus of a coordinated effort of promoting early child development and promoting and enabling, nurturing, and cognitively enriching environments for children. And so we also know from good evidence that interventions such as these can be very cost effective. They can be cost 20 cents per child per year to incorporate um, the promotion of early child development into a healthcare system. So we know that they can be very cost effective in addition to being effective. So here's our recommendation for the Thrive area, which is that we should really focus, USAID, PEPFAR, and implementing partners should really focus on these, thinking about children who are after, after they've survived to then think about allowing them to thrive. And these are four key interventions that we're recommending. So the first is to provide adequate nutrition. So this also relates to, um, to the survive goal, but this is for optimal infant and child cognitive development. The second is to reduce childhood exposure to domestic and other violence. So this could include one recommendation we have, which is birth registration, which can prevent early child labor, early marriage, and then trafficking of children. Um, the third recommendation is really focusing on maternal and parental mental health to detect and manage postpartum depression and then detect and manage um, parental mental health. And then finally, to really support and promote early education and cognitive stimulation in young children through parenting support, um, opportunities for daycare, and opportunities for preschools so that all children can be ready for school. So now Amy will talk about the big red arrow. Um, as the committee was addressing these um, high priority areas for investment, in each case we were identifying ways that the government could be um, using its, its, uh, its voice, focusing its investments, engaging with others, that there were some common themes that fell out. Um, and so we spent as much time then talking about this issue of how can we maximize the return on U.S. government investments in global health, both monetary and people. Um, and this recognition that sort of the business as usual approach of how government has traditionally worked isn't adequate and isn't going to be able to sort of solve these kind of challenges that we've been highlighting and wouldn't give us the impact that we wanted. So these three areas of catalyzing innovation, smarter financing, and global health leadership and influence um, were the, the, the kind of cutting across all four domains. On the catalyzing innovation, it was the recognition that the innovations, these better tools, vaccines, drugs, diagnostics, medical devices and tools, and also information technologies are absolutely essential to be increasing the, the affordability of healthcare interventions, the ability to reach more, pop, more, of the pe more people, and also the effectiveness of the interventions compared to current standards of care. So that as we looked at how do we prepare and respond for global health security objectives for pandemic and outbreak response, um, or uh, tackling the problems of TB, um, or sh ensuring children survive and thrive, the recognition that we need to be getting even better tools than we have today. There was also the recognition that in the US there's a really rich um, community in academia, in biotechs, um, in the industry that we have. Um, that are essential partners in the research and also in the translation of the science and technical know-how into actual kind of products um, and approaches that can reach, um, reach the countries, can reach markets. But there was also a lot of discussion of some of the key barriers that are preventing, in particular, technical innovations. 
Um, and the fact that many of the most important products have long and costly and unpredictable development um, uh, processes, um, in often because there's very weak R&D capacity in the other countries, for example, to help support clinical trials, and very often because there's very unpredictable markets. There's uncertain demand, there's uncertain financing um, uh, that leads to uh, a lot of risk for industry to be investing. Um, so as we looked at the kinds of push and pull, push mechanisms that help uh, push products through, the, through the, the development cycle or pull mechanisms that help provide a kind of a market guarantee to help create more incentives, um, we came up with a number of very specific recommendations. First was around a whole suite of in, uh, recommendations around enabling innovative approaches for trial designs and highlighting many of the things that the FDA um, has, or, and BARDA and the Department of Defense um, and other parts of NIH have already been um, piloting or um, promoting actively, for example, um, uh, um, priority review vouchers or adaptive trial designs, um, and the need for us to go even another step um, on how we think about this, while of course maintaining um, safety and efficacy. Um, second was around um, opportunities for streamlining regulation, and that the FDA needed to have the kind of resources it needed to improve the tropical disease priority review voucher programs, but also assess the application of provisions outlined in the Generating Antibiotic Incentives New Act to Neglected Tropical Diseases. Um, highlighted the importance of ensuring production capacity and the role that BARDA has played in its efforts to help promote global production uh, manufacturing capacity for priority technologies. Um, also highlighted the important role that the U.S. government plays across many of the different groups in terms of creating market incentives. And that's not, that first and foremost is about having better data about what is a market, um, as well as sort of new financing types of mechanisms um, that help to uh, reduce uncertainty. And the role that of our investments in groups like Gavi and the Global Fund in helping create these kind of volume guarantees um, are, are really critical. Um, finally, um, in this domain, we highlighted the importance of building international capacity for research and development. Um, CDC, many of the NIH, or HHS groups, CDC, NIH, and then also DOD play important roles. We particularly called out Fogarty and its role, but helping build the human capacity and the clinical capacity, the lab capacity, um, to be able to do better research in countries. Um, as we looked at the space of innovation, though, we also highlighted a new domain of innovation that's really changing the frontier of what's possible in global health, and that's the space of um, information and communication technologies or what we call digital health. Um, and highlighting that the potential that the advances that we're making, particularly from the Bay Area, um, in um, ensuring uh, access to real-time data, uh, real-time uh, synthesis of this data, ability to be stacking data with things like geospatial mapping, um, enables the world to have a level of, of big data that's sort of the digitized individual um, at scale that we've never been able to have before. Um, but that it takes a real investment in, in digital health systems. And one of the points that we we're making very strongly in the report is that the U.S. government and countries themselves are not realizing the potential of this, of this technology. Um, one of the main reasons for that is, and the U.S. government's a, a guilty party on this, um, is that each agency, and often within an agency, programs are all investing their sort of pot of money in their own disease. So they're developing a digital health system for AIDS tracking and another digital health platform for just doing malaria um, and so on and so forth. And, some, and then NGOs are encouraged and academia is encouraged to just do an app for this one piece of it. So the result is this, this kind of clutter in the system of all of these um, highly kind of siloed uh, data pieces that aren't kind of connecting, they're not interoperable, um, and the whole data system itself is not kind of bringing in um, other uh, important parts of data that would help make for actionable uh, decisions. Um, so the very strong recommendations we are providing in the digital health space was around the need to be, um, be making, uh, investing in country-led programs that are building interoperable digital health platforms that can efficiently collect and use health data and analytic insights uh, to enable the delivery of integrated services within the country. We're also highlighting the important role that the U.S. government plays 
in helping support the technical assistance to countries in the development and implementation of these types of platforms. And in particular, in this case, was USAID and the Global Development Lab, which has been a, a, a one of the leaders in this early space. Um, and then finally in this space, we highlighted this build once principle that was um, articulated in the Digital Global Access Policy Act um, about investing in uh, this shared, these shared platforms, the infrastructure necessary uh, uh, as, a, um, as a way to take forward the, the digital health objectives. The second domain that we focused on was around smarter financing. And smarter financing of how do you use that dollar to actually deliver more impact. One of the things that was um, the, the panel, dis the committee discussed quite a bit was that the financing in global health is changing very significantly. Who is doing the funding, how they're doing that funding, and how we're starting to look at balancing short-term and longer-term investments are all changing radically. So some of the highlights of the change in, in the who's investing, where is the money coming from, one of the things we're seeing around the world is that low middle income countries and middle income countries, their economies are growing faster than many of the high income countries. And as a result, there is a, there's a big movement towards countries that you know, once their economies reach a certain point that they transition out of bi bilateral and multilateral aid and move towards domestic financing. Of course, countries are already financing the vast majority of their programs, but often things like the introduction of a new vaccine is being funded through sort of a multilateral partnership like Gavi. And a number of other kind of key innovations are funded through these different partnerships. So there is this move that these countries will be transitioning away from these sources of funding and be responsible for um, all of the, the investments in their health programs. A second key change is that the traditional donors that we've been looking at, not just the US government, but we're also seeing it in a number of other players, much of that funding is, is at best flat and in many countries it's declining. A third major change is that a whole new um, type of funder, these impact investors, social venture um, capitalists, uh, family foundations is on the, are on the rise. And many of these groups are looking for sort of a space between being the, the venture capitalist getting a 30% return and the pure philanthropist providing a 100% grant. So they're looking for both a social return and a financial return. And these, these groups are changing the rules for um, about what, what they want to invest in and what kind of data they need to make an investment and how they want to engage and who they want to partner in. Um, and this space has the potential to grow dramatically. So one fact that is, I think, you know, quite stunning is that, um, that right now a number of, of um, banks are predicting that over the next 15 years there will be a transfer in inherited wealth of $30 trillion, that's with a T, trillion dollars. So this space of what the role of these new types of, of investors are is, is, you know, could have an, 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 an enormous impact on um, these global health objectives. The third key change in who's investing is around industry. And there's been a very big shift in the private sector um, towards investing in emerging markets. What used to be considered ROW, or rest of world, is now being seen as the markets of the future. And industry is making a much more concerted effort to be seeing how can they be engaging these markets, how can they learn the needs, um, the distribution channels, so that they are prepared for that shift in the future. As we looked at this area, we had a number of um, recommendations around transitioning towards more investment in uh, longer term, um, longer term investments. So for example, the issue of digital health. How can the US government balance all of the investment it makes currently in, in short term, kind of vertical, as well as in some of these longer term shared platforms that can have uh, uh, such an enormous effect. Um, also, how can it be looking at new mechanisms such as results-based financing, shifting from input financing to outcome and output financing. Um, ways of using the US government dollar to have risk sharing that brings in more private funding. Um, and ways that helps leverage up what the governments themselves are doing. So as we see this transition to more domestic financing, are there ways that we can be using our programs today to be ensuring that, that, um, that we're laying the groundwork and we're supporting countries to lay the groundwork to having the necessary information, the right policy environment, to be um, evolving their budgets, to be investing in the highest impact uh, um, efforts 
um, and innovations uh, to drive their programs forward. Um, we also highlighted a number of the, the um, new, new types of financing that the US government is already doing, for example, development credit authorities, and, and recommended that we um, not only maintain these, but actually start to expand it so that the government kind of creates more space, more flexibility for these type of innovative mechanisms. The last area that was, um, we highlighted in the cross-cutting was really around global health leadership. And the recognition that the US government's engagement and leadership in international agencies and in partnerships um, and in dialogue with other countries is absolutely essential. It provides the US with the situational awareness to have early intelligence as to what's happening in the global health arena. And it gives us a great deal of influence as to the direction of how the whole world is tackling these global health objectives. Um, we've, we also highlighted that other countries, in particular China, is very happily filling the leadership void that's being left by the US. Uh, they're increasing their participation in global health and in development around the world at, at quite a clip. And in fact, they're now establishing what will become the equivalent of a USAID um, in China to be um, systematically investing in development priorities. Um, we looked at some of these international partnerships, and in particular, we called out WHO, which performs such an essential function because of its ability to convene, to coordinate, to set norms and standards in global health and provide technical advice and guidance that is highly credible to countries. However, as we all saw in the 2014 Ebola outbreak, it really exposed the very deep weaknesses that exist in the WHO's capabilities and its leadership structures. And so, you know, we, we referenced all of the different reports that have been going on that have been highlighting the types of reforms that WHO needs to change um, in order to be a more effective organization. And so our recommendations were first around how HHS and State Department using US influence to improve the performance of UN agencies generally, but most particularly WHO, and to require that these reforms are adopted. The second was around the role of HHS and State Department um, maintaining its engagement in these global health partnerships that have proven to be so effective and so influential, um, and notably Gavi, Global Fund. Mike already mentioned the Global Health Security Agenda, um, and others like the World Bank Global Financing Facility, because those help further the impact that we can see with our dollars and have um, great influence with countries. Um, the last recommendation we had was around uh, how we can use that US voice also in the diplomatic arena. And we recommended that the US um, needed to establish a foreign service career track in State Department that actually addressed global health, which doesn't currently exist. So that we can be building a cadre of global health experts that can engage in country to country dialogue around health priorities. So when a country has graduated from development assistance, we have this other mechanisms to ensure that we can be, um, be influencing and supporting um, the type of global health we want to see that's going to have an impact on the whole world and also on the state of US, um, US health. And highlighted also that they need to, uh, to amend the Foreign Service Act so that experts that are in HHS um, can be serving some of these key roles. So those were some of the, the ways that we were highlighting that the US can maintain its leadership and overall start to use its voice, use its, its, its funding, and um, use some of the, the flexibility within the agencies to be leveraging and maximizing kind of um, our investments and, and their impact. Great. So I have two questions, one for each of you, and then I will pass the microphone to anybody who has questions, because I'm sure you do. So the first question's for Amy. Um, the theme of the report is really that we can't do business as usual. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what that really means and what we're saying and why now? Why would we say that now? I mean, everyone here at Berkeley learns about best practices, but maybe we need to think about really just doing things in new and different ways. I guess I'd say that um, this, this, you know, historically it's been a, a kind of a more simple model. We've known the money came from governments. It was more of this bilateral, multilateral role. We all knew kind of who did what. And uh, we had the MDGs, which sort of out of the eight goals, three of them were around global health. And they were pretty straightforward. Um, we've evolved into this very different world where we have the SDGs. And it's really about that space across different sectors and different disciplines uh, and the impact. So 
how do we achieve health through our work in agriculture? Well, the health sector doesn't like talking about agriculture. Um, how are we thinking about things like digital health and, and, and you know, information technologies and bringing those into our sector and the discipline? Um, how, what is the issue of, in, you know, we know that investment in women's education has some of the most profound impact on global health. And yet, the global health people don't invest in that and don't sort of prioritize that. So how are we thinking about that cross work? The issues I already mentioned about the funding changing. So it is not going to be, you know, we all know the rules of the game. We all know what's good. We all know what to invest in and how we, have, you know, how we invest. We're playing with new actors. And we need to be able to understand what does it take to engage these, these new sources of funding. Um, and they're frankly challenging us. They're saying we need to have better data. How do I know it's not better for me just to give a dollar as opposed to investing in what you're doing over here? Right? Prove that to me. We didn't have to face those kind of questions when we were working with, with traditional donors. And I think it's good. It really forces us to think hard about how do we add the most value. So that's also changing. And lastly, I think, you know, as we highlighted, there's a number of challenges, and particularly the global health security agenda, that is, um, that is, uh, is, is, is frightening. And it's one of those uh, um, areas where you pay now in terms of establishing you know, the sort of preparedness platforms, or you're going to pay a lot more later, both in terms of money and in terms of lives. And again, we haven't been very successful in how we approach those types of problems. And so, so there's some very different challenges, and there's also some very different opportunities. And you know, I think this can't do business as usual is that we need to, we need to respond on both fronts. Great. Thanks, Amy. And for Mike, the question is maybe percolating in everyone's head, is any of this realistic? <laughs> and is there any chance of any of it happening? <laughs> <laughs> so and maybe you could also talk about what's happened since the report was released. What are the realities of the White yeah. House? Okay, so we, we're now going to talk like we're not necessarily representing the National Academy. Because uh, <laughs> right. we have been presenting the report as loyal citizens, Amy and I. Um, I think, just to emphasize first, that there was a similar report written in the late, uh, before President Bush became president and then before Obama. President Obama became president, or as they were becoming. This is the third time the National Academy has done this. Um, and it used to be called the Institute of Medicine. But what, what's interesting is, as Amy has beautifully articulated, we just didn't give diseases, which is what had happened before, and recommended more money for WHO, which is what happened before. We really tried to anticipate the future. Um, and a lot of time was spent about, as you heard from Amy, things that w were, were cross-cutting and were different. It's a much different report than the previous two reports that the Academy did, because the times are so different, as Amy has articulated, because of the technology, because if you look at the data, AID told us maybe they'll be supporting 15 countries with bilateral support by 2030. 15. Not because of cuts in the State Department, but because of the the, the development of, that's going on in middle-income countries that have the kind of gaps now that they, that they need to deal with in terms of resource <laughs> mobilization. So we really, as a committee, tried to be not be political in the recommendations we were making. And we also tried to anticipate no budget growth. So if you were to look at the report, we didn't, there's not, in previous reports, I forget what the number was, there was a call for increasing the global health budget I'll pick a number, three to five billion dollars. We anticipated no growth, or very little growth. So we did, and there's not a lot of budget numbers in the report, but we really tried to present what we thought was the right thing to do at this current time and in the next five to 10 years, whoever was president. Now, of course, we were aware as we went on about uh, what was first called the skinny budget, those of you may know, which had been leaked. Uh, as you know, it's not hard to leak things, apparently, from the government. <laughs> and so there, had, there was a leak budget which called for enormous cuts in USAID, enormous cuts in CDC, even more enormous cuts in NIH, uh, abolish, abolishing of the Fogarty Center, uh, which, which uh, doesn't have, its, it's total, total budget is $70 million, it's tiny, but it was a symbolic anti-government, anti-global uh, kind of uh, response. We, we um, chose to be optimistic that despite skinny budgets and despite what we heard, we felt that we shouldn't let that 
color our decisions about what we felt was the right thing to do, and particularly since we had to be evidence-based. Those of you who have followed the politics of this know that the House has passed its budget uh, for next year, for the FY19, and all of these cuts were restored, essentially. Not completely, but almost all. Climate change, unfortunately, was hit, but, but for the most part, the, the cuts that have been proposed have not been now happened in the House. The Senate will take this up soon. Um, I can just tell you one anecdote. My university president went to see our Senator Burr, who, who, and he started to talk about his, the university's concern about the indirect cost issue. You may know there's a proposal to reduce indirect costs to 10% across the board for all grants, which would cripple universities. Um, and the Burr, he, he couldn't get one sentence out before Senator Burr said, stop, the Senate Republicans love NIH, don't worry. So, so I, I think we are uh, probably going to overcome the fears th through this report and other efforts underway to at least not have these kind of budget cuts. Could something be slipped in in an omnibus bill in December? Sure, uh, but hopefully this won't happen and this report is being used in, in, in this way. I do, uh, it, to help fight these kind of cuts. But I do think the point that Steph made early on is really important. There is an anti-global rage out there right now in the world. And Steph mentioned the UK, our own country. We survived in France, barely. Uh, I can tell you I've just recently been to Sweden. It's, it's there. Uh, and and uh, we as, you know, we are faced, as Steph said, with this great globalization and, and all that's, that, that has been achieved and could be achieved, but it's, uh, but it's a wagon that is now hitched to a populist world. And so the really interesting question is not, not the Trump himself, but the fact that 35% of Americans believe in the, roughly, 30 to 35%, are, are, are faced with, are advocating populism, but why? Because of the disparities that we in global health care so much about. They are poorer, they can't get jobs, they, they um, are feeling uh, the elite has suppressed them. So in fact, it's a response to a disparity, if you like. And so the question really becomes for those in global health now, how do we continue our field, sell our field, um, raise the uh, importance and awareness of all that can be done in global health, but at the same time realize that we're in a new era with regard to populism around the world. And I think this is a really interesting challenge that academia, in my view, has to play a role in. We need to think about this. We can't just disregard it. We, and the whole issue of how information is trans, uh, transmitted, what is believed and what is not believed, we need to study that. We need to understand what is happening around us if we're going to be able to sell uh, our agenda and continue to promote the things we really believe in. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not giving a definitive answer to that part because I think we're in it right now, and, but, but we need to address it. And universities like Berkeley or Duke or, or PATH, we all need to be taking this seriously and not disregarding it because this is the reality that we live in now. Now, we did not address this particularly in the report, uh, but it's certainly on the minds of many of us in the field right now. Maybe Steph will give us the answer to that. Are you going to answer that question? Oh, I'm, I'm going to pass the microphone. <laughs> but um, because we are live streaming the event, I'm going to ask um, everybody who would like to ask a question to wait for me to pass the microphone to you. So Steph, that. Why um, don't I, I'll, I'll speak. Oh, you have another one as well. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> um, but you're, you're, you need to stay in the screen. <laughs> the um, one here. We'll start right here. Well, we'll move up the uh, upper row. Sorry. OK, I'm. Um, please introduce yourself. I'm uh, Malcolm Potts. I've worked internationally in family planning, safe motherhood, and women's education since 1978. The people on the platform, my friends, I'm going to say something profoundly challenging. Please accept it as sincere and respectful. What I have heard has been a very professional 20th century discussion of global health. I think it is not commensurate with the problems of the 21st century. Those are population growth, global warming, how to not destroy the biosphere. We've gone 70 years without dropping an atomic bomb. 
I think it's unlikely we go another 70 years without doing that. How do we make a sustainable economy? There were, there were 85 million more births and deaths on this planet this year, the highest number in human history. 1% of OECD aid goes to family planning. That needs to be raised to 2%. That is politically achievable. It doesn't cut into anybody else's budgets. That should have been the number one recommendation of your report. Conflict is very dependent, but one variable is population structure. When I first went to Afghanistan, there were 12 million people. Now there are 30 million. In 2050, there'll be 12 million men, young men with little education, no job opportunities. There is no plausible way that uh, mortality, infant mortality across Afghanistan will not rise. In the Sahel, there'll be 300 million people by mid-century watching their crops wither and their cattle die with nowhere to go. AIDS killed 30 million people, 30 million carry the virus. This is a much bigger challenge. Please write a 21st century report for the Academy of Sciences. I'm gonna let the committee think about that because it was more of a statement than a question and take a couple more and the panel can come back, because I see quite a few people raising their hand. Um, I had a, sort of a similar question. I wondered, maybe out of just curiosity. Oh, my, I don't, I'm Jan Marotta. I'm a retired Kaiser internist. Um, I'm down and dirty in the clinic. Um, what I was wondering was what you did about the issue of family planning and women's access to contraception and abortion rights. I mean, I, did you just drop it because it's not politic, or I'm curious. Okay, one more. Um, there was one more arm up here. Yeah, oh, thank you. Oh, good. Please, go right ahead. Um, so, um, my name is Prapik Chetri, and uh, I am from Nepal. I grew up in Nepal, but right now I'm at the School of Public Health doing um, interdisciplinary masters in public health, uh, MPH. Um, and even though I do not, I do not have um, all the acronyms uh, behind my name, as you all do. But I've, I've spent uh, quite a bit of hours, like myself, low and middle income countries, and all. Um, if you look at the problems of, um, uh, for me, the the problems lies greatly in in terms of access and innovation. Access. We live in a society in a system where you know people like uh, Shkreli is allowed to hide high price of dare print from 1350 to 750 overnight uh, or even if you if you talk about um, you know some of the NCDs cancer medications most of them are not uh, not affordable even for people from this country from high income countries you know we don't even have to talk about people from low income countries from innovation part you know it's it's a system that incentivizes more research, puts more research and development money for um, uh, male pattern baldness than malaria, as Bill Gates mentioned. And you know, there's that classic 90-10 gap. And um, at, the, at the WHO level itself, there have been um, recommendations, there have been uh, bills, uh, well, I don't know the technical recommendations that went into the regional, the the uh, WH level discussions that on you know R and D financing, like changing the system, and um, that countries like India, South Africa have majorly favored, and because uh, United States time and again shuts it down because of uh, influence of pharma companies. So, uh, to s summarize, my question is. Um, have you looked into the R&D financing um, alternatives uh, to you know, look at the larger access and innovation problems, or was that not possible because of participation of uh, pharma industry and the panel itself? I know that these two guys have spent enough time in international organizations to be used to countries asking multiple questions and having to respond, but I think that's enough of a mouthful, um, and you guys uh, could, could please respond. I just wanted to mention that the third question over here chose not to ask her question because she said that Malcolm had asked it for her. So back to you guys. On family planning, do you want to comment? 
No, I mean. <laughs> in our recommendations that focus on family planning and access to contraception. So it, it, while it wasn't a headliner re, in our report, it was certainly there. Uh, I don't know, if, Mike, if you want to say any more. No, I mean, Amy, you want to talk about AIG? Yeah. So we talked about this a lot. Let me just say, I want to say, I repeat what I said earlier. If you asked me as an individual, what are the priorities in global health in the world today, that is a different question from what should the U.S. government be doing in global health, given its capabilities, its budget, its history, its expertise. I just want to make that general comment. I am not doubting the importance of climate change. I am certainly not doubting the importance of population control. I just think I want to come back to what our charge was, which was not to tell the world what's the most important priorities in global health. Amy was, had, had the most recent experience in the U.S. government and was very helpful in this regard, so I'll let her comment further. But I only ask your indulgence to understand what our, what our, what our terms was. There's not a debate. I mean, I under, we all understand the importance of climate change. I mean, you could not not if you were on the planet. But it was not, it's not what the question we were asked in terms of global health for the U.S. government, just to make that point. And you have a, pre, a PEPFAR program that has been incredibly successful dealing with an epidemic uh, but, but it has historically taken 50 to 60 percent of the budget. Cutting that it was a would be a huge decision at this point in time, given the imperatives of care, given the imperatives uh, of the diplomatic relationships with countries, given the, the relationship with the Global Fund. So I, I just ask you to bear in mind what our, uh, what our terms of reference were for the report. I'll let Amy comment on the U.S. government issues, but just please remember that. Uh, as you pass to Amy, though, can I just... Mike, you said what the U.S. government should do. You didn't say what this U.S. government should do, but I would assume that the committee thought a lot about sure. what this U.S. government I think that's what Amy will do. talk I mean, about. I'm yeah. curious. <laughs> well, I, <but laughs> I'm going to give Amy a chance Thanks, to think Mike. About. Well, I just think that it's important to point out that our role, as we consider our role to be neutral, and as a matter of fact, that was something that kept being emphasized. We were supposed to just review the literature and um, synthesize the evidence to then provide recommendations and not, and we did talk a lot about this because the changing government occurred halfway through between meetings one and two. So I think it's important that we were, we were asked to be a kind of objective body with, and, and not have too much of a stake in, it, or be advocates. So it was a different role that we, that we were asked to play than what it sounds, than, than exactly with the, if we had been asked to say, like, like as Mike said, if, if we were asked to say what's the most important, um, issue in global health, there was, that would be a different answer than what we were tasked to do. Forgive me for pushing back a tiny bit, yeah. but that wasn't really what I meant by my question. What I meant by my question is there, there are the facts and what is recommended, and then there is real politique, <laughs> right? right? So yeah. the, if the headliner of your report was that the U.S. government should ensure safe abortions around the world, then you knew that the entire report would be ignored by this government. So if, in fact, you want the other recommendations to be listened to, this would not be the time to lead with that recommendation. We did I'm, have that conversation. Okay, so I'm, uh, th th there's, you can be factually based, <laughs> yes. but also cognizant of your audience yes, yes, yes. We in did terms that. of likelihood of impact of your recommendation. Right, and we didn't right. want it to be distract a distracting message. We wanted to make an, sure that it was. It's not an accident that your top two things are securing against global threats and enhancing productivity it's, and economic growth. It's not an accident. <laughs> yes, these messages were tailored to the current government. Yeah. That is the answer to your question. So I, I don't think there's much to add. I mean, I think USAID has been the, the primary um, uh, channel for the, the work that's been going on around family planning and access to contraceptives and continues to be extremely dedicated to that within the bounds of how far they can go with, with Congress. Um, the work that's been going on around family planning and access to contraceptives and continues to be extremely dedicated to that within the bounds of how far they can go with, with Congress. Um, and with the administration's support. And that's something that um, we, uh, you know, we highlighted as one of the most effective forms of, of an, in, an investment and in intervention um, to go forward. I would, um, I would sort of combine it with this other question around, did we look at sort of the financing of R&D and how to ensure larger access um, issues and, and innovation and, and would say, Yes, very much, because this was not all about how do we make pharmaceutical companies happy to go invest in Viagra, right? 
It, it was around how are we looking at what are the priority um, areas where we need investment and we need better tools for global health priorities. And we need to make sure that those tools improve access, are affordable, and or improve the effectiveness of the interventions as we're delivering them. Um, so the types of things that we were looking at were ways, uh, you know, a variety of different ways that would help promote all of the different types of products that, uh, that we saw. And I would highlight that, that, for example, looking at something like a Cyana Press, right? So this is something that um, the Gates Foundation, PATH, uh, with a number of partners have been working on around how do we take one of the preferred forms of contraceptive, the long-acting injectable contraceptive, that women like because it's discreet, it's convenient, but right now they have to go to a health clinic to get access to it. And so that has now been, um, now this, this, it's a Pfizer product that's being repackaged, right, in a pre-filled, super simple little injection device that has a little pouch, a little plastic pouch, with the needle actually attached. And what's happening is it's dramatically changing access because this now pre-filled syringe is, can go to the community rather than making the woman go to the health center. And many countries are now passing policies that say women can self-inject. So it's, it's the type of innovation um, that we're actually even working with Pfizer and Beckton Dickinson on, um, but at, to, to assure a price point and to really improve access. It was also very much about the issue of country level innovation. And we think, you know, R&D is not just American companies. It's also how are we helping to invest in the innovation ecosystems in country to be promoting the kind of contextualized, adapted innovations um, that are, are best, are, are scalable within certain country contexts. So both of those were very much discussed. I just want to add your comment about whether our conversation was in any way inhibited. I will assure you it was not. The members, the members of the committee from Pharma were as open as anyone could be from Pharma. They were very helpful and positive. And one of the, to me, uh, pleasurable experiences of being on the committee, coming in with certain biases, was how creative and productive they were. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be sure, in, in, despite what you, uh, what you may think when I say that, that we had tremendous contributions from the members of the committee, mm -hmm. uh, from GE, from I think Novartis. Novartis, yeah. uh, they, they offered a great deal of information and knowledge that frankly many of us didn't have and, and seemed quite willing to endorse all the recommendations in the report. I have the next one up here. Hi, my name is Alan Kittner and I work with emerging growth companies, particularly in the digital health area. And I'd like to preface my question with an assumption. Uh, let's assume that this report is adopted and fully implemented. Given that the budget, it's essentially budget neutral, um, and there's some fairly strong recommendations around change and resource prioritization, who are the losers? <laughs> Take a couple more before we go back to the panel. If anybody, <laughs> well, go ahead, you go ahead and answer that. Well, so we see if somebody else wants. Steve, here. Are there any losers? So you th now are we? Now go ahead. But you have so to you threw a teaser at us. You said there's going to be all this private philanthropy money coming out, and <laughs> there's a risk of a tower of Babel mm -hmm. that there's no coordination. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a place? where there was an inventory of where those resources are going globally, where there's a sense of need, where people could come together at a neutral forum, whether or not there's a role for government or some other group in that, I'd be interested in your comments because it seems to me we have the opportunity to do a lot of good also to waste a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, you never talked about Gates. I have to say, I kind of thought it was refreshing not to talk all about Gates for once, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's my Seattle perspective. <laughs> Who are the losers? I, I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> who are the losers? say losers, you mean who Who's didn't get funding? Who's or, funding is taken away. I mean, there was no, we didn't do that kind of analysis. I'm not sure what you, I, I'm not ducking your question. I don't know what you mean by losers. There's, it's You're not like. In the new things you recommend. They're but there, the but the investment need not necessarily come from the U.S. government, number one. Uh, there was, a, you know, in other words, I, if you want to be specific on digital health, we can talk about digital health. I'm not. I think there, you can talk more about that. Yeah, I'd say actually two things. One, to Mike's point, is a large part of our report was about how can you actually take one U.S. dollar and leverage four other dollars towards your endpoint, right? So it's increasing the, the coordination and the efficiency by virtue of bringing things together. 
Also, how do you think about, um, you know, how can you use one US dollar that reduces the risk significantly enough so that industry invests $10, right? Which is, um, or, so there, and that actually does happen. <laughs> um, so, so looking at that, that kind of equation. But I think the other issue was, for example, the amount of money that the US government invests in digital health through these siloed programs and the amount of money we waste is, is huge. It's absolutely huge. So a part of it was also mm -hmm. that if you were to use that same amount of money and instead of investing in 12 different suboptimal, unscalable kind of efforts and instead invest in one sort of interoperable platform that was well designed that others were investing in, you could get a lot more out of it. So I think that was one of the reasons why we ended up having that kind of cross-cutting look was it wasn't just about throw more money in the same old way. It was about use the monies we have in, in, in more effective ways. I mean, have you looked, seen the healthcare worker with six different phones? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the reality right now, and that's what Amy's, I think, talking about. I mean, that's, that's the U.S. government, different programs, not just the U.S. government. But, mm. but you know, the poor health worker's got a different phone for each uh, program that he or she is working with. That, there's no, no effort been to integration, even in our own um, aid programs. On the other program about sort of more philanthropy, well, I think it is a teaser because I don't think we're realizing it yet, right? So I think that we're starting to see a lot of, um, a lot of a certain, certain donors certainly coming forward and certain philanthropists sort of coming forward and you have the new Zuckerbergs and, and whatnot kind of coming to the table. Um, a lot of others that aren't, right? And so the promise of what the future could bring I think is uncertain. I, I have seen a tremendous amount of of like, you know, there's talk here, I want to invest, and there's all these sort of needed, necessary, like, innovations that are looking for investors, and we can't seem to sync it up. And so there is a lot of, um, you know, we haven't got that system together. Whether it's a, a global inventory of resources or a better way of cataloging sort of investment opportunities that provide the right kind of data to, um, to stimulate them, I think a lot of those things have to be explored. Um, but matching up that potential sort of where the needs are and where there may be sources of funds, I think, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. For Gates, I would say that um, I think Gates has, has done an, an unbelievable job of sort of stimulating this sort of new, new world. I mean, the, the giving pledge that they have where um, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates mm -hmm. and Melinda Gates are going around and talking to these you know, richest people in the world and challenging them to actually um, give away their wealth in this lifetime. And so saying, not saying what they should invest it in, not saying it has to be health or the things that the foundation's interested in, but saying whatever your passion is, wherever your beliefs are, give some of that wealth back. And I think that um, that's something that, uh, you know, that's, I think that's really been part of the genesis of this new, this new way forward. I thought Steve was gonna ask a different question because he whispered it to me um, <laughs> when I was sitting next to him. And that was in response to the, to the point that Mike, I think you made, that um, China is stepping in to the vacuum created by the US. And, um, and the question that he implicitly asked was, is it a bad thing for China to get more involved in global health? And um, I'm sure what you don't mean is that it's a bad thing for them to spend money in developing countries <laughs> to promote global health. But maybe you could elaborate a little bit on, on uh, what you did mean and what you think the role is for US leadership? It's a very interesting question because we have used this China card in some of our lobbying to maintain the funding. <laughs> um, seriously, it's not something the current administration uh, likes to hear, um, but that's another issue. I think it's good that China has moved from a situation where most of its foreign aid was dictated by its Ministry of Commerce uh, to thinking much more about seeing health aid in a development context. This has been a major shift in China. Uh, now you need to remember that China's, and maybe soon India, I don't know how long, but, but that China is one of the few countries in our generation that's gone from a recipient country to a donor country. And, in, and I've spent a lot of time talking within China to, to leadership about this, and they are really trying to figure out how to be responsible donors and not see it simply as giving, now let's remember, half of our foreign aid, but we've, we've dated and see they're trying to figure out how to be more responsible donors. The challenge is when, if they are not, if they use their money for, for priorities, let's just say, that are not appropriate 
uh, to build another 100 hospitals in Africa, which is one of their big n new initiatives, uh, or to send another 100 Chinese medical teams around Africa over the next few years rather than building local capacity. That's not a good idea in terms of what we believe in our own foreign policy and in our own committee report about strengthening nations and helping them be more self-reliant. So we want China to be a partner very much because they have the resources. But we were hoping they'll be a more responsible partner and be a more collaborating partner. Right now, the Chinese have very few people in their embassies that deal with health. They don't have a core, a, a foreign policy core that's knowledgeable in health. And, and yet they're putting an enormous amount of resources into the countries. Uh, as I say, n primarily for economic reasons. So the, the question is to me, how do we continue to encourage China to be a partner, but to be a, a more collaborating partner? And I can tell you that the British government and the European Union are all thinking hard about this and trying to get the Chinese to collaborate more in, the, in their programs in, in low and middle income countries. Let's also remember that they do things that we don't do so well. If you look at what happened in Ebola in West Africa, go talk to the nations of West Africa. Who helped them the most? It, the U.S. came in late, and in the end, we didn't do nearly as much as we could have. The Chinese were there early. They, they provided a lot of supplies, equipment, and, and care that no one else was providing. They went right into West, those three West African countries when we were still sitting wondering what we were going to do. So I, I do think, Steph, your point is well taken. We do want China to be engaged. They do have the resources. We'd just like to do it more in a partnership and have them be more of the developed world community. They're, they're struggling with this. They don't know yet if they really want to be equal to the UK, the US, Gates, et cetera. But, but I think we need to work with them because they have the resources and they're going to continue to do this. If you just Google the One, one Road, One Belt initiative and you see, just learn about the trillion dollars they're initially putting into that, not just in health, but in other development issues, we have to, we have to try to, to be with them. We can't not be part of this. We can't not uh, collaborate with them. That would be a mistake, in my own view. I know that others might feel differently, but I think that would be a mistake. Just before I pass it to Art, can I just follow up for one second on that, because you mentioned Ebola. Um, Mike, I think it was you again mentioned the failure of WHO in response to Ebola. At the same time, you were talking about the need, or the, then Amy talked about the need for U.S. global health leadership. Um, is the answer fixing WHO, or the U.S. being ready to be the global health leader in the next in the next emergency? Well, <laughs> fixing WHO, I don't know. Um, so the the big thing, of course, we were faced with in the discussing WHO was there's a director general election was going on, and they have selected a new leader, and and the question is, is WHO able to deal with the deficiencies that we saw in Ebola simply because we have a new director general? In my own view, no. In my own view, there are fundamental issues in the governance of WHO that unless these get solved, I don't care who runs the organization, it's going to continue to face uh, the kind of deficiencies and challenges that it, it's faced now for at least two to three decades. So I don't think it's simply having a strong director general. That helps, don't get me wrong. But it's, there's, there's no business or organization that can have seven leaders in different parts of the world, six regional directors and a, and a director general, all selected in different elections uh, that can be efficient. So I think we have a fundamental flaw in WHO. Maybe it can improve uh, where it was. What happened, of course, in Ebola, if you know the story, they just ignored, they had a very tiny office and they ignored it, what was happening. They are better equipped now, Steph. They have more people, you probably know that. They have a little bit more money, and they're, they're, but I, I don't think they're quite yet at the level to provide the global leadership that we need. But I, can I just add, I think that the rest of the world would not accept the U.S. government being the, like dictating right. what needs Correct. to be done. They will, however, accept a multilateral organization in which they're members, if the organization could be more effective, in that kind of role. And so. I don't think the U.S. could ever fill that, that slot. That's what I thought you were saying. Art? So Art Rheingold, uh, so just one quick point about WHO and then a different question, which uh, WHO has never been and is not now resourced uh, to be the kind of response agency that uh, 
uh, that is needed. Uh, so it's fine to say that they should do it and not someone like CDC or the Chinese or the Japanese, but it's not just a question of leadership. It's a question of resources and capacity and a whole host of other issues. But Art, just to answer that, you're not, they can't get resource because it's, it's a circular problem. I understand. They can't get resource because people don't have confidence in them. That's the problem. But a simple change in leadership is not necessarily Correct. going to I create that capacity or Completely those resources. Completely agree. But the other point I wanted to make is, Mike, that you were, I think, appropriately sanguine that the Republicans in Congress love NIH. The problem is NIH basically does and supports research and research training. And what's needed in terms of global health security is not more, NIH, more R01 investigators. It's the kind of work that CDC and potentially USAID can support. And there's absolutely no uh, evidence that the Republicans in Congress are equally supportive uh, of the agencies in the US government uh, that are needed to do this kind of work. Well, I think what I mentioned was what we, I don't think CDC's the answer to this. I think we felt quite strongly that there needed to be a new framework and a new agency of some kind formed somewhere in the government to provide that kind of leadership and could call on CDC or other parts of HHS. We, 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 we don't have time now, but we looked all across the US government. When it comes to emergency response, what different parts do. And you would be amazed how many different entities there are that, ha that have in their in their mandate dealing with emergencies, but no one is in charge. And so the issue there is can we mobilize CDC and other agencies within the government in a more coherent way that would really, uh, particularly domestically, but also globally. Um, I, I, I don't know if the Republicans think that's a bad idea. Uh, there has been some discussion already, even a proposal from the president for some kind of increase <laughs> response capability in the US, I think it remains to be seen. I'm not saying that CDC is, is getting well funded. I know that they're still at risk of a budget cut, but I'm, I'm just wanting to point out that our view was that for the, the emergency response, and we look carefully at FEMA. Some of you may know the history of FEMA. FEMA is a much better agency now than it was uh, 10 years ago or even five years ago. The framework that has now reestablished FEMA is actually quite a good framework. And if you've looked at their performance in Houston, it's been much better than it has been previously. And that's because of the new framework that was put around FEMA. We spent quite a little bit of time. FEMA is under Homeland Security. And we didn't, we had some concerns about putting this new international framework if there was a FEMA-like structure for, for global emergencies in Homeland Security. That is one option, but not one that we were ready as a committee to sign off on. And it's the fundamental problem that you can't be the coordinator and the doer because part of it, because yes. other parts of the government aren't willing to accept CDC's leadership um, because they're direct competitors. Correct. Right. That's certainly part, don't you agree? Yeah. So that means that the coordinating agency that you talk about can't become itself the executor. It has to have the power of coordination without. And the question is, where would that be? And we went around and around and talked to a lot of people in the government even to the individual who had been the czar, the, the, the Ebola czar during the Obama administration. And he gave us a bunch of ideas, but even he was unsure, you know, because he came in late and he really couldn't get that much done. But the question would be, if you were to stick, have such an agency, where would it sit? That's really the question. And you didn't mention PEPFAR, which is another obvious example. PEPFAR is a coordinating agency, yes. not the implementers. And done, fair, and done well. Sits within the State Department. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the State Department obviously doesn't execute health programs except through USAID, which of course is and CDC. Yeah. Well, but I, USAID being part of the State Department, yeah. but not part of PEPFAR. Interesting. Last opportunity, folks. So seeing no hands, what? <laughs> going once, going twice. <laughs> Hi, Bridget Brennan, and I represent PATH here in the Bay Area. And I have a question about different agencies um, that it was made reference to um, agriculture and other areas where now with the global goals, the sustainable development goals, where we're looking at these more um, overlaps and intersections of agriculture, nutrition, climate change, mm -hmm. so planetary health, human health. I'm wondering if there were any recommendations about integrating um, recommendations health um, promotion through Department of Agriculture or through 
these other agencies, if that came up at all, as we're thinking about alter alternative proteins or improving um, access to milk, um, education with uh, early childhood development and such. I would just say an example for relating to thriving was that we did recommend integrating the education opportunities within existing structures as opposed to going and developing a new body that's going to oversee early child development to say, look, what can we do within the health sector? Can we talk to providers about um, promoting child stimulation at a six-month visit and a 12-month visit when at the same time as you're talking about growth or growth monitoring? So I think that was a big focus, a cross-cutting focus was integration and not trying to um, replicate and duplicate in, in different sectors. Do you want to add? No, I want to ask Steph if I can ask one question to the audience. Um, How could I say no? Okay. No, I mean, you are, you are a very leading academic university in this country, and you have a lot of faculty, ex-faculty students in the room. What about this question of our future as a, in global health? And what about what do we teach our students, and how do we deal with the, the reality of today is, and, and, as a field? I mean, I'm, I'm really, we're all searching as leaders in the field for answers, and, and where academia can play a role. And this, to me, is very important. And no one's asked questions or commented on this, but if anybody had any thoughts, however radical they were, it would be interesting to hear. Because I, we're really in a different time now. And, and we get a lot of questions from students, at least at my university. Should I really go into global health? Is there really a future uh, in this current environment? And so I, I just want to be a tad, maybe no one will want to answer, but I just, <laughs> at least would you think about it? Because I think for the sake of the field and for what we all believe in, these are burning questions in the mind of our students and our faculty today, uh, given the reality of, so we have a report, like it or not, of what we think the US government should do, but then we have the reality of not just the US, but of the world we're in today. And I, I think we in academia have got to think through hard how we're gonna deal with this. Oh, I see a hand. I have a, I have a brave volunteer. <laughs> I don't really have an answer except to say that I am a student at the School of Public Health in Berkeley and I do want to go into public health without, I think, ever having to ask that question. Um, uh, speaking to why, uh, it was mentioned very briefly, but the 50 million refugees um, and the issues that we're going to see both in the current refugee crisis that's been happening over the last few years um, and to the previous comments about population explosion and how competition for resources and increased needs are going to more than likely generate even more refugees econom from, for economic reasons, for um, um, violent events that are, um, I think, always unfortunately an eventuality, but especially considering um, the realities of uh, governments in 2017 and going forward. Um, I don't really know if I have a request from professors as far as to like what students might need um, other than maybe access to reports like these or maybe topics on things, you know, ignoring that, not ignoring, but <laughs> you know, that idea of can't do things business as usual, um, allowing students opportunities to really, you know, challenge that business as usual. Um, best practices are great, um, but the world changes every day. It's different today than it was yesterday. Um, so incorporating that maybe is, is the best thing, Leah, as my professor. Another answer here, but I'll come over to this one. Hi, I'm a current undergraduate at Berkeley, and I actually have more of a question. Um, I recently watched a Netflix documentary called What the Health. I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> But it talked about how uh, the meat, dairy, and agricultural industries have an influence on um, like US government health regulations and the way that they publish certain reports or um, guidelines for the uh, American population. And I was wondering if lobbyists had an effect on global health, and like a negative, perhaps, effect based on their own company motives, if that makes sense. Anything about this? No. I'm going to come over there for the comment, and then I'll. I don't know. That, I don't think any of us know what, what, like, uh, much about this. This is about in, the industry lobbying for. Well, I mean, just to give you an example from oh. the old days when you and I were together, the U.S. government bought lots and lots of condoms, 
and you could buy them for 30 cents from Georgia or from seven cents in Malaysia, oh, we just have to buy them in Georgia. Um, that was a, an example, I think, of the kind of things you're talking about where, you know, do lobbyists in Washington influence sure. policy? Um, uh, and, and the, the answer is yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt. And I, I was going to say, I don't think you guys would. I mean, there's not much yeah. to say, but yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think we have to listen to the next generation. We're not in a position to talk to them and teach them what to do. We've left the world with lots of mistakes. I am enormously and sincerely impressed by the way in which students will react to the problems that they face. They're the first generation that faces these existential problems and the last one that can solve it. So I've seen the evolution of a class with the following structure. You have an hour's lecture on some topic every week because any university has world-class people in climate change, in agriculture, in nutrition, in population, and you name it, infectious diseases. And then the students have discussion sections which they lead. In the, and they report back next week on what was their response to what they heard about climate change. And then they put together teams and they come up and they just learn and you get information in such a different way. And I think we have to build on that fact that they if there are solutions to the world's problems, they're with the next generation of students. And um, I've learned and so been so inspired by what our students can do. And I would like to see this plan sort of regularized and put into other universities. I call it a sustainable worth world, challenges and opportunities, because there are opportunities. There's a tsunami of new scientific information which will ameliorate all the problems we face. The problem is to get that moved. And I think we should help students say, what is going to happen to me when I graduate as a professional or as a citizen of the world? How am I, what, am I, what are the problems I'm going to face? And they will be so creative in answering that question. Well, I think it's now up oh. to me to thank. Oh, I, we, we'd gonna, like to, but yeah. I, I've right. been, my phone is buzzy, buzzy, oh, busy. <laughs> Get it, let everybody drink wine. Stop. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So I'm going to, uh, unfortunately, cut it off, but I think we'll have a little opportunity outside. So I just want to give a big round of applause and thank you to our panelists and our, our people who are here. Really appreciate it. Okay. He's quite a count. He's quite a count.